Big question. Are you crack? I, uh, when I was in high school, I didn't pay too much attention to history. But now that I've got a little older, I say a little, probably lying, a lot older, <laughs> I, uh, I kind of love history. We uh, went down to uh, Gettysburg, me and Mary and Angela, one uh, summer, and we spent three days down there looking at all the history and everything. And I really, uh, I really liked that. Like I say, when I was in high school, I never paid attention to any of it. So, but someday I would like to make a trip to Philadelphia. I was reading an article the other day. A guy was telling about his vacation to Philadelphia, and it was really interesting. They visited Betsy Ross's home, as well as Benja Benjamin Franklin's grave. Their guide told them that people threw approximately $3,000 in pennies on Franklin's grave every year. Does anybody know why that is? It's because he once said a penny saved is a penny earned. The guide told them that Franklin had made more money in death than he ever did while living. They also visited the Independence Hall where the Declaration of Independence was signed. And it was also the first building where the Supreme Court met. And of course, the building where the Liberty Bell is housed. While they were viewing the bell, the tour guide was telling about its history. The Liberty Bell was made in England and after being shipped to Philadelphia, cracked the very first time it was used. The bell was recast, adding some extra copper for extra strength, but many complained that no longer had a pleasant sound when it was rung again. It was recast with more copper, but that didn't make it sound much better. The guide gave many other interesting facts about the bell, and when she finished her spiel, the man asked if she knew that a Liberty Bell has once nearly been battered away as scrap metal. She looked at him very oddly and wasn't sure if he knew what he was talking about. But he said it was true and went on to explain. Back in 1828, the city fathers had decided to give the bell to a bell maker named John Wilbank in exchange for a replacement. Wilbank agreed to knock $400 off his bill for the 2,000 pound relic. But when Will Banks went to collect the bell, he decided it wasn't worth the trouble. The city sued him because they really didn't want it either. It only, its only value to them was $400 discount that Will Banks had given them, or offered them. Finally, Will Banks relented, gave them the discount, and then turned around and donated the bell back to the city. Will Banks didn't believe the bell was worth the trouble of hauling it away. And frankly, he was right. The metal was substandard. It was so damaged from structural weakness that it was rung only rarely. It had only been rung a couple of times in the past 150 years or so because of the fear that ringing it would result in it being totally destroyed. Now let's see how we can apply that unwanted bell to us today. And frankly, he was right. The metal was substandard. It was so damaged from structural weakness that it was rung only rarely. It had only been rung a couple of times in the past 150 years. And it was cracked. And unless it was useless, it was good for nothing. And yet today, in order to get into the building to view that bell, you literally need to go through a metal detector, flanked by armed guards who are there to make sure that no one attempts to damage this now valuable relic. The Liberty Bell is valuable. Not because it's inherent value as a bell, but because it had, won had been rung when the Declaration of Independence was signed. It's now priceless because it had once been used to declare freedom. Throughout the New Testament, we're told stories of people who for us 
have become household names because they were once used by God to declare freedom. They have become as priceless to us as the Liberty Bell has become to our country. People like Peter, James, John, Mary, and Martha, which we discussed in class this morning. They're examples of changes that we ourselves can bring. We can see changes in people's lives. If we allow ourselves to be used by God, one of those examples was a man named Philip. Now, Philip is only mentioned three times in the Bible. When we're first introduced to him, he's being nominated by the church to be one of the deacons to help take care of the destitute the distribution of food to the destitute wid widows in the congregation. It's not really a high-profile job, but Acts 6 tells us that he and the other six men who helped in, his, in this ministry were required to be full of the Holy Spirit and wisdom. Not too long after Philip was nominated and given that responsibility, King Herod began to persecute the church in Jerusalem, executing the apostle James and imprisoning Peter. Many Christians, including Philip, fled for their lives to other cities and regions. Philip went north about 35 miles to a region of Samaria and probably began to share his faith with the people in that city there. We're not told how big this city was, but as soon as he arrived, he began preaching about Jesus and converted nearly the entire city to Christ. Now today, if you want to be a preacher, most of the religious world would require that you be ordained. How are you ordained? Is a group of church leaders must vouch for your knowledge of scriptures and your love of Jesus. And that group of church leaders would have laid their hands on you, ordaining you to preaching the ministry. Now we know we don't need to do that today. Most, most churches would require a preacher to have a Bible college education and many even require seminary training. But as far as we know, no mortal man had adorned, uh, ordained Philip to become a preacher. He hadn't gone to Bible college or seminary. He hadn't preached at a church on Sunday morning and he may not even had taught a Sunday school class. So why was Philip preaching? Because he was open to being used by God. And as a result, this deacon of the church changed the lives of dozens, perhaps hundreds of people just because he was open to being used by God. In addition, because he was open to allowing God to use him in that city, God gave him another special assignment. Philip was sent to preach to a high official from the court of the Queen of Ethiopia. Uneducated, just a common man, but God called him to go and to do his work. He was being used by God. Now I got to thinking, why did God send Philip to perform this important task. The Ethiopian, Ethiopian eunuch was an important person. You'd think that God would have at least sent Peter or John or Andrew or one of the other apostles to speak with him. But he didn't. Why not? Why not send in the important church leaders? The big guns to preach this treasurer from Ethiopia, the gospel. Why send Philip? He's not nearly as important as all those other guys. Remember the story of Paul's conversion to Christ? Paul's on the road to Damascus. Jesus confronts him, blinds him, and then sends him on to Damascus to wait for someone to come talk to him. And who does God send? Who does God select to give this special message to Paul? This man 
who would become such a powerful leader in the early church. This man who would plant so many new churches and who would write nearly half of our New Testament. Who does God send? Does God send a delegate from an important church in the area? Does God send one of the half-brothers of Jesus, like Jude or James? Does God send some apostles? No. He sends somebody named Ananias. And even, uh, does anybody know how many times Ananias is mentioned in the scriptures? One time. That's it. And even then, we know virtually nothing about him. We don't know if he was a leader in his local congregation, whether he'd ever been given any special responsibility before. For all intents and purposes, Ananias is a minor player on the Bible stage. A godly man, no doubt, but seemingly not only, not one of the powerful leaders in the church of his day. Now let's think about that for a minute. Why would God do it that way? Why would God send in the second string players when converting people of importance? I believe God did it that way so that we'd understand that He doesn't need the so-called important Christians to share our faith with others. He wants all Christians to share their faith. The special privilege of taking to other people, to talking to other people about Jesus should be a privilege to us. Are we afraid to do it? Yes. I still hesitate at times before I say something. And then if I do pull back, then I always walk away and say I should have said something. But it's only human nature because you don't want to be rejected. It's just uh, common knowledge. You don't want to be suggested. He wants us all to share our faith with everybody that we come in contact with. It's not just the domain of the super Christian, whatever that is. Bringing people to Christ is what all believers ought to strive for. A man observes that uh, scriptures compare us to sheep. We read in Psalms 100 verse 3, Know that the Lord, He is God. It is He who has made us and not we ourselves. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. And then he asked, besides wool, what do sheep produce? Sheep, more sheep. That's what they produce. That's right. Sheep produce sheep. The flock of Christ will increase in direct proportion to how we sheep do what sheep do. We should believe in this concept so much that we should be inviting people to services all the time and talking to people about Jesus. Remember, one of the things we as sheep should be doing for Jesus is producing other sheep. So how can we prepare ourselves to produce these other sheep? Well, first of all, we need to put ourselves into it. We need to be eager to do it. We cannot win people to Christ if they can't see the excitement for Jesus in our lives. We're told that when the Spirit told Philip, go, what did he do? Philip ran to the chariot. Now I want you to think about this for a moment. When was the last time we ran to tell someone about Jesus? And the question we need to ask ourselves is, are we excited about Jesus? Do we actually think about what we need to do and what has to be done? Excited enough to run and tell someone about Jesus. Acts 8.29 tells us that he did just that. So Philip 
ran to him. Philip was excited about telling the man about Jesus. He desired it so much that he ran to the Ethiopian chariot. He didn't want to miss the opportunity to share his faith. Philip realized that sharing his faith with others was important to God. And that there was virtually, there was nothing else in the world that was nearly as important. Do we feel that way? Do we feel that way today? There was an eagerness in his approach and a fire in his heart. The saying goes, a burning heart will find a flaming tongue. Our excitement for Jesus should be a little like the excitement of this little boy I read about. It was a true story told by a mom who wrote that she and her husband, he, she, he and her husband had spent the day moving from their farmhouse into their new house in town. Early the next morning, their three and a half year old ran into their bedroom to wake them up. She dressed him and told him to play in the yard and to quit bothering them while they unpacked. About 20 minutes later, he came running back into the house all excited. Mommy, mommy, he cried. Everybody has a doorbell and they all work. <laughs> he was excited. So first we be excited. Second, we have to make ourselves available. Philip asked about Jesus, talked about Jesus to whoever would listen. Like I say, we don't know how many people he converted. It doesn't tell us. Many people don't share their faith because in their hearts they compare themselves to others in the congregation and say, I don't know as much as they do. I don't have the training they do. And I don't have the ability to talk like they do. In short, what they're really saying is, I'm inferior to others in my ability to share Jesus. Think about that for a moment. What can you do in your everyday life to actually share Jesus with people? You may see yourself in much the same way that the people back in the 1800s saw the Liberty Bell. It's a piece of junk. In fact, it was such a piece of junk that nobody would even haul it away. I don't know what it would be worth today, 2,000 pounds of copper, that would be quite... I know it probably wasn't pure, pure copper, but still, it would be worth quite a bit of money. Our value depends on our availability. Let me repeat that. Our value depends on our availability. When the Liberty Bell was made, there were other bells that were better made, that had a more pleasant ring, that had no imperfections, and yet none of those bells have near the value of that liberty bell because they didn't proclaim our nation's freedom to the world. The liberty bell has value because it was available. It was there when the need arose. Does anyone know who Jerry Rice is? The younger kids probably know here that he was a longtime star for the San Francisco 49ers football team, among others. And he's considered one of the greatest receivers in the history of football. In fact, his talent was obvious even when he was in high school, drawing many big league colleges to approach him with scholarships. He was interviewed back in Black Entertainment Television. They asked Rice, why did you attend small, obscure university like Mississippi Valley State University in Itabina, Mississippi? Rice responded, out of all the big time schools such as UCLA that recruited me, MVSU was the only school that came to my home and gave me a personal visit. Now think about that for a moment. We need to be available. Jerry Rice was one to the small college because that college was there when he was looking. That college, that college's people made themselves available to give him 
the attention that he needed to sign. Be excited, be available, and be prepared. When Philip witnessed to the Ethiopian eunuch, he knew exactly what the prophecy meant that the Ethiopian, Ethiopian was reading and was able to lead him from there to the point where the eunuch excitedly pointed to a pond beside the road and literally begged to be baptized. Knowing the Bible is why we stress Sunday morning classes, Sunday evening worship, and Wednesday night classes so strongly. It's why I use so much scripture when I'm preaching. The more you are in the Bible studies and, and at church, the more of God's word you'll understand. And the more you'll be able to use it with confidence. But even if you should encounter someone who asks you about a scripture you don't understand, you could always say, hey, I don't know, but give me a couple of days and I'll get back with you. I used that line in my classes when I taught massage therapy. When I, had, I know I've said this before, but when I had a freshman class come in, I would just make an announcement at the beginning of the class, if you're here to stump the teacher, you may be able to do that. But I'll guarantee you that if you stump me, the next day I'll bring the next class we have, I'll bring the answer back to you. And that's what I would tell them. Because there's no way you're going to know the whole Bible. There's no way you're going to know all the scriptures. And then there's no way you're going to get around how it's being twisted around in the world too. And be able to explain that also. So it's important for us to be prepared to use God's word to witness to our friends, our families, everyone we come in contact with. Philip was there. He was available. He was excited. In Acts 8.26, we're told, and this is where he gets his, he gets his instructions, and then he arose immediately and he ran and did what he was supposed to do. And he ended up converting this man of authority and baptizing him. He didn't ask questions. He didn't say, sorry, I've got something else to do right now. He just got up and he ran. He is prepared to be used by God. Are you? Are we? He's looking for God to give him opportunity to talk to others about Christ. And every once in a while, God will give us an opportunity to do that. But we must be ready. We must be excited. You don't have to be a scholar. But you do have to be really ready with the truth. People can't argue with the truth. And one thing I need to say about argue, once it turns into an argument, walk away, it's not going to do anybody any good. The Apostle Paul is a prime example. He went out and was killing Christians. He was actually trying to protect those traditions that the old law was all about. And even things that men such as the Sadducees and the Pharisees added to the law, he was trying to protect those things even though they were false. Paul felt that he was doing the right thing and Jesus had to tell him he was wrong. In that encounter on the road to Damascus, he told Paul what he needed him to do. In closing, I want to share this cute story with you. It reads, In my freshman year of college, I had two Jewish roommates who knew I was a Christian. One day I found them sitting looking very unhappy beside an open window in our dormitory. I asked him what was wrong. We want to play basketball, said one. We've looked and looked but can't find a ball. Hey, Paul said to the other with a mischievous look in his eye, 
You think Jesus has a basketball we could play with? Well, maybe he does, I grinned. The big grin. I'll pray that Jesus will send you a basketball right now, but if he does, I expect you to thank him for it. Okay, they said. So I bowed my head right then and there, and I prayed aloud to Jesus for a basketball. Within five seconds after my amen, a basketball fell through the open window into the lap of my roommate as if it had fallen straight from heaven. His jaw dropped. Then a third friend shouted from out in the courtyard, I found the ball for us, let's go. They claimed it was a coincidence. I responded, you know whom to thank. thank. We need to be thankful for Jesus, for what he'd done for us, dying on that cross, that cruel cross for us. If you have a need this morning to be baptized, we can do that for you. Or if you have a need to come back to the Lord, we can pray with you. Please come as we stand and sing.